One of the other things I've been reflecting on over the summer is gut health. We didn't know about this organ really on a on a big scale, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years ago. It's not, it's pretty new. What are we missing? And in particular, Tommy, you mentioned some of your friends who are eating maybe what might be termed a carnivore diet these yeah. days and are seemingly thriving. And I had Tim Spector on in July. And I mentioned to Tim, because Tim was talking about gut health and talking about 30 plant foods a week. And I mentioned, and I've got patients like this, I've got friends like this. One particular friend of mine who I spoke to Tim about, I said, Tim, but I've got a friend who has tried everything. She used to be paleo, she was vegan, she was raw food. She's very educated on health. She's a practitioner. And about five years ago, she pretty much moved to close to carnivore. And I don't know many people, she's in her fifties, she is thriving. She looks great. She can run ultra marathons. Um, I've done stuff with her. I've seen her work. She can work for 14 hours straight, cognitive function, completely just as good at 9 p.m. as it was at 7 a.m. It's phenomenal to see. But I'm thinking, if we take a step back for a minute, there are so many reports of people thriving on these animal heavy diets, autoimmune symptoms going, joint pain going. Like we can either put our head in the sand as a profession and go, no, you've got to do this. You've got to eat more fiber or go, wait a minute, well, what's going on here? Why are people not following the dietary advice and are thriving? And she's also done all her blood tests, her triglycerides, HDL ratio is fantastic. Her HbA1c is amazing. What's your perspective, Tommy? So I completely, you know, on, on the gut front, and again, I I know people who are much smarter. I know much more about this than, than I do. So I've I've learned a lot from them. One of them is uh, Dr. Lucy Mailing, who I wrote this this paper with. Um, and I think the gut has really been this thing where the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. Um, and again, the 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 paper we wrote tried to come at this from like a, a first principles idea, which is that, so if you think about the wide variety of, of environments and diets that humans thrived in and thrived on, how common is it? How common would it have been for you to have 30 different plant foods in your diet in a week, right? You're in Greece, two things are in season tomatoes and aubergines. You talked about that, right? What are the other 28 that you're supposed to find in the environment? Like, it's just not something that our guts ever, you know, are used, quote unquote, used to seeing. That doesn't mean it's bad, right? I'm not saying that it's bad. Yeah. I'm just saying like, what are the things that, you know, our guts have helped us through in the past? And if you think about it that way, then you have to think about scenarios when like there were no plants, right? So, so you know, we've come at it from this idea that uh, for the gut, plants are essential, fiber is, fiber is essential. And that's pretty much because in large population studies, um, we've told people that that's the case. So people who are more health conscious do that, but they also don't smoke and they sleep more and they exercise more, right? The healthy user bias. Um, and if we think about our guts and, you know, the rest of the body is the same, but in a healthy individual, it's, it's adaptable to many different types of fuel, right? Um, is it blood glucose or is it fat or is it ketones, right? These, dif these different um, sources of energy that you can use that you need to run your heart or your muscles or your brain, your gut is the same. And the traditional story is that you need fiber, that, that your gut bugs turn to something we call short chain fatty acids like butyrate that provides the fuel for your um, enterocytes, the cells in your gut. But what you see quite clearly is that your gut can use a wide range of fuels. So yes, it can use those. If uh, if you eat predominantly plant foods, you'll make short-term fatty acids like butyrate. That will that will be the source of fuel. But if you eat more protein, then you'll make what we call iso short-term fatty acids. And those essentially have the same function. So you can support your gut health just fine with the metabolites from meat rather than plants. The gut, the gut cells will still use it. Uh, you can also use acyl carnitines, which are metabolites of fats. Um, or if you're on a ketogenic diet, the the it doesn't come from inside the gut like those other things do from the gut bugs it can come from the blood so you can take the the cells in the gut can take ketones from the blood if you're fasting or um 
you know, fasted because there's no food available, right? If there's no food available, your gut still has to be able to survive. It can't just like give up and stop working, mm. right? Because as soon as you get food, it needs to function. So then if you're, for whatever reason, don't have access to food, your body makes a bunch of ketone bodies and the gut can use those for energy as well. So the gut is incredibly metabolically flexible based on the systemic health of the body and physiology of the body. So what I think we've seen in a lot of studies around the gut is that something that affects systemic physiology affects the gut. And then that affects the types of microbes that get selected for within the gut. Well, let's, so, ju let's just back up. Systemic physiology, well, how would you say that in layman's yeah, terms? Yeah, so, so basically your general health. Right, so so you do something that's affecting your general overall health. Yes. That's then affecting the health of your gut. Yes. And then you're measuring bugs in there and we're, making, we're drawing conclusions from that. Exactly. And it's, uh, it goes in both ways. So we know that the bugs in your gut can affect your body. But it really seems like what's happening in your body elsewhere, and that can happen with changes in sleep or diet or physical activity, right? So when you exercise, that affects your general health. It affects what happens in your heart and your blood vessels and your muscles. They you know, secrete a bunch of um, chemicals and hormones and things like that. That, can, that affects your health, it also affects your gut. And then what happens is your gut is affected by that, like just by your health changing. That then changes the kind of bugs that survive in that gut. So you'll see things change within the gut, right? You'll see different bugs, but it's because of what's happening elsewhere in the body. Mm. So I think we've ascribed too much to the bugs that we measure. And it's also the bugs we can measure. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we're just not able to measure. And this has been another problem with um, studying the gut microbiome is that historically we've used um, a, a cheaper measure called um, looking at something called 16S RNA. Um, and when I've talked about this um, previously, it, the level of information it gives you is it's like, if you think about the lineage of dogs, right? They're in animals and then canines and then the the sort of that the house dog, mm -hmm. the dog that we have, dogs that we have at home. So a 16S RNA can tell you this is a dog rather than a cat, but it can't tell you whether it's a French do bulldog or a Doberman, right? Which are vastly different dogs. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with gut bugs. So it might tell you, yes, I think I have an idea what this bug is, but it tells you nothing about its specific functions. Um, and a lot more about what's happening in the gut is based on the function of the bug rather than what the bug is. And yeah. so vastly different bugs can have the same function but you might just focus on one that has a specific function and think we need this when actually something else entirely could take that function. So it's the information that we have is incomplete. Um, I think we've ascribed too much, um, you know, too much to its, to yeah. its activity. doesn't mean it's not important. I think it's very important. No, for sure. But I, I think we've given it too much credit and, and taken away what's maybe happening elsewhere in the body. And the also time. maybe it's not even given it too much credit, but it could also be, you know, we're overly focusing on lifestyle change, influencing the gut microbiome, influencing our overall health. Maybe it's just the lifestyle change is influencing our overall health, as you say, which is then influencing the gut microbiome. Exactly, exactly. And this is one of the key things I think I've evolved my view on uh, over the past few years is this maxim that we need fibre for optimal health. I, I don't know the answer to that. I've just, I'm very open-minded and I, I just, I can't um, make that work in my head cognitively and also see many, many people thriving, literally thriving in every way that I can see on low fiber diets. Yeah, I think it doesn't add up. Like we've got to do better. Like there's, there's. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And 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 again, um, I think when we when we've looked at some, I'm not going to say that fiber isn't important because I think in, in the in the setting of the the modern mixed diet where most foods are ultra processed, and we think about the things that we talked about earlier that may be able to you know help support gut function, you're probably not getting any of those. And in that setting, fiber may be beneficial. It's also uh, fiber in the diet when we ask people about their diet. 
it's like a marker of a bunch of other things. Like yeah. usually if you're eating more fiber, you're eating higher quality foods um, and fiber may affect things like satiety, right? So if you're eating more fiber, then maybe you eat total fewer calories in an environment yeah. that encourages us to eat more calories than we need. So there are these signals that maybe it's beneficial, but that doesn't mean that it's essential. Yeah. And, and just to just to clarify my own view, I'm also not saying fiber is not important. Yeah. There is plenty of research which is suggesting that more fiber is associated with better health outcomes. I've written about this before, right? So I'm I'm just, I think we always need to remain open-minded yeah. and go, just because we believe this to be true, just because everyone said it was true, maybe it's a partial truth. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's true for a lot of people. And also the other thing I think with diet, Tommy, is that when we look at these ancestral populations, these hunter-gatherer tribes, and we look at what they're eating, and you know, the Hadza tribe in Tanzania are reported to eat a ton of fiber, maybe 100, 150 grams a day. I've seen in some reports compared to, you know, an urban population, a Western population that may be struggling to get 15, 20, 25 grams a day, right? So I get that on the face of it, it seems like a huge difference. And hey, we want their health outcomes, so let's do that. Let's increase the fiber. But it also depends, doesn't it? That diet on top of what? Yeah. So if you've grown up there with low stress eating naturally in sync with the seasons, you know, without the the urban Western societal pressures that, you know, affect all aspects of our physiology. Well, maybe that diet works really well, but maybe, maybe in the, you know, the world in which we, we live, you live in America now, I live in the UK, but so many people have got poor metabolic health already. They're already um, got suboptimal health. So maybe they need a corrective diet. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. kind of like, and I, I sort of hypothesize in my first book why a low carb diet seems to work so well for so many people in the Western environment might be because we're overly stressed, we're underslept, we're uh, undermoved, we're, we've had too many calories at the wrong types of calories. We, we are insulin resistant. And therefore maybe in that setting, there's a, there's a kind of unique role for it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, I'm not saying I've got the answers or I'm, I don't think you were saying you've got the answers either, but it's worthy of discussion. Yeah. Um, in, in my mind, uh, there's this, you know, every, every, everything that we use to describe human health, everything we use in biology is some kind of model, right? Um, and because we can't, we can, we're unable to completely explain everything, right? It's not physics. And even in physics, they can't do that. Um, but there's this famous, uh, George Box is a statistician, has this famous quote, which is called, which says, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And I think that's, that's really, and I think that's really important to think about because everything we're, we're talking about here is some kind of model to, to describe human health. And if your model doesn't allow for the individual that is doing amazingly well eating nothing but beef, then your model is wrong, right? It, then it's more wrong than any kind of model you can build that, enc that, build, that, that yeah. uh, encompasses that. So I always think like the outliers are important because they force you to change the parameters yeah. of your model. And if you don't, I think that's incredibly unscientific. So yes, you can say that's interesting. I want to learn more about that. But at some point you then have to try and incorporate it into whatever model it is that you're building that says, you know, well, why is it that we're seeing, the, you know, if humans can thrive in a scenario where they're not eating any fiber, then that has to be incorporated into the model yeah. somehow. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Muscles, right? We've we've drawn an analogy. You've drawn an analogy earlier on about muscle health and brain health. Yeah. And I'm really interested as to practically what advice would you give to people who want to optimize their brain health in terms of, yes, physical activity, but but I guess specifically, I'm interested in in muscle. Um, I know, you know, you lecture on this. You, you're going to give a talk, I think, this weekend yeah. on, on muscle mass and longevity in uh -huh. the UK, which you'll hear. We had Dr. Gabrielle Lyon on recently. She was talking um, about protein intake, uh, the importance of resistance training. I would love your perspective on these things. So I obviously haven't heard your interview with. Uh with uh, Dr. Gabrielle, but I imagine that I will have agreed with pretty much everything she said. So 
you can hear what I say, and then you can, because in general, I, I think she's 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 fabulous, and she she focuses on on really important things, which is muscle tissue and protein intake. Um, and the re I mean, there are multiple reasons why muscles are important. There are biggest glucose sinks. So you talk about blood sugar, you talk about you know that being important for diabetes risk, but also cardiovascular disease risk, uh, dementia risk. Seventy five percent of your blood sugar is taken up into your muscles. And the more muscle you have and the more you move it, the more glucose blood sugar that they take up. So if you're trying to regulate your blood sugar, which is relevant to the vast majority of, of adults, because they probably, you know, again, the average individual at least has prediabetes, average adult in, in the US and the UK. And, and similar studies have been show, shown that in Europe. That's pretty alarming. Yeah. And so so I think the, <laughs> the projected number in the US is 60%. Um, have at least prediabetes, or obviously if you progress, then that includes prediabetes and frank type 2 diabetes, 60% of US adults. Currently? Currently. Or, and do you know what that figure is in the UK? Um, I believe it's 40 or 50%. Yeah. So muscles are your most important glucose sink. If you want, right? if you want to regulate your blood sugar, you need to create somewhere for that blood sugar to go, right? Um, and muscles are the thing. Seventy five percent of blood sugar goes up into into your muscles. So the more muscle you have, yes. the easier it is to regulate your blood sugar. Absolutely. And the more you move it. So and so both are important, right? So the total mass and then how much movement you the, the amount that you move it. Um, and there are there are several studies that have shown that. But you can in you know again in type two diabetics you can put on continuous blood sugar monitors or look at their you know blood sugar and the more they move the better their blood sugar is controlled. Um, and if you have more muscle and you move it more, you can control that even better. So that's one reason why muscle is important. It's also, um, it's a, it's an organ. Like it secretes factors and hormones and things that we're still learning about, right? Um, every month, there's a another paper in a fancy journal that says, we just learned this thing that happens when you exercise and it makes this molecule and then we inject that molecule into mice and they live longer. That speaks to what you just said about the gut, right? Yeah. How long have we been studying muscles compared to how long have we been studying the gut? Years, decades yeah, on decades. muscles and we're still learning new stuff that we're yeah. like, oh, we didn't realize. Yeah. If you enjoyed that short clip, I think you are really going to enjoy the full conversation, which you can check out here.